Hi there everybody and welcome to Sean Camera Photographic. Thank you so much for joining me again. You're very, very welcome. Now, do you remember a few months ago we had a look at the Nikon D1? The camera Fleet Street adopted and inspired the phrase the end of the beginning of the digital era and the beginning of the end of the film era. Yep, I went on and on about this being back in the days of Bill Clinton and Tony Blair and Game Boys were suddenly available in colour. Yep, we were talking about 1999 and I'm afraid I'm going to have to drag you back there. Because I told you about my journey through the magical world of the D1 menu, just to select RAW. Well, here it is in all its glory. Printed out pages and pages and pages. Ugh. A few smart cookies reduced this down to a small card that you could carry with you and some were even designed to fit into the inside of the LCD display protective cover. Can I just ask you, How did they read it? Anyway, that's how I left it. That I was gonna source a spanking new battery and here it is. Sadly, after 20 odd years, there's no juice left in it and I can't resurrect it. So, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna chuck it. I'm, I'm too fond of Nikon. Okay, so I bought one that comes from China. I can't pronounce it, and it only cost me 22 quid. Now, I'm not endorsing or promoting aftermarket market. I can't even say it. I'm not endorsing aftermarket batteries. In fact, I tried buying an original, and I've just told you about it. So, I was left with no option but to go aftermarket. So, <laughs> how did it change everything? My original problems were that I had blank images um, every time the, it thought the battery had run out, um, intermittent, intermittent high frame rates. Did it solve any of it? <laughs> no. <laughs> now this could be because I've been sold a bit of a pup. I mean, after all, the old girl's getting on a bit. I think that the certain problems were always there and age hasn't improved it. I mean, I could hardly expect it to heal over time now, could I? But I promised you some pictures and I don't lie because here they are. Now, you notice the colour is a little rich. And it's not least because it used NTSC colour space. And we're used to sRGB or Adobe RGB. And the other thing is, you can see, I cannot stop the whites from being totally blown out, even in the shade. But am I asking too much? After all, this was the first digital SLR to be produced solely by Nikon. It revolutionized the camera and photographic industry and it de deserves its place in history. And my office shelf, which as my wife says, is rapidly turning into a bloody museum. Now bearing in mind that the D1 was $5,580, what if I told you that you could have got a really decent little camera released in the same year for less than a thousand? It's digital. $999 or about 600 quid at 1999 exchange rates. Mind you, they're more expensive by the time they get over here. Here we are. The Nikon Coolpix. It's the 950. Now this camera has a really nifty trick. How cool is that? How cool is that? 
any technophobe just, oh, we just love stuff like this. The previous one, because this was, oh, they produced quite a few over the over a few years, over a couple of years. Now, this one was the second version of it. The first one had problems because that bit wore out and it was due um, to the ball bearing. So they solved it by putting a larger ball bearing in. It seems to have solved it because 20 years down the line, it feels pretty solid to me. I mean, half the problem is you tend to hold it like that. So there's quite a lot of weight going on it. And it is weighty and it's solid and it boasts a magnesium chassis. That's right, you usually find those in pro cameras. It weighs 465 grams with batteries. Why do people tell you what it costs without, what it weighs without batteries? When would we ever take a camera out without a battery? Ah, oh, it's one of my favorite subjects. It so annoys me. So yeah, 465 grams with batteries. Now, everybody was really, really excited about the 950's ability to capture directly in TIFF format. Though, to be honest with you, with a maximum CF card capacity of 64 meg, you would have only been restricted to, to 11 images. So you'd have been better off sticking to JPEG, to be quite honest. But it also included a flash sync socket unit. So in other words, a socket for the flash. But for the life of me, I can't find a flash mount. So I don't know where you were supposed to put it. The known problem was and is the battery door. It's a ridiculous design. It doesn't hold the batteries in properly. And yeah, you can't even tape it up really. But it is what it is. But the camera works. And it actually produces some really acceptable images. Now, both of these cameras were up against this, the F5. It was released in 1996 and it lasted until 2004. And it reigned supreme until the D1 knocked it off its podium. And it went for about the same amount of money as the D1. Both, both cameras, they were roughly the same money. And people were furious that they bought the F, the film camera, digital had taken over, and people were asking, can I buy a digital data back for my F5 that turns it into a digital camera? And as far as I know, the answer was no. Now, the one thing I do notice, and I'm quite obsessed by, as you've noticed, is weight bat with batteries and frames per second. And I thought at this point it was well worth me talking about the F4 frame rate, my darling little F4, was 5.7 frames per second. The F5, eight frames a second. Now think about this, this was in 1999, eight frames a second. It wasn't exceeded until but I'll buy a DSLR until the D3. I mean, that's, that is quite some time. I mean, that's, that's pretty ahead of its time. Though the F3H, I believe it was, made a low, it was made in really low numbers for the 1998 Olympics. That actually shot <laughs> 13 frames a second, but they were a complete anomaly and it, and, and it was a one-off. So, as I say, that, that amazed me, that amazed me. My D5 only does um, 12 frames a second, 
pretty impressive. So, the D1, 4.5 frames a second, well slower, almost half, almost half. So anyway, you're thinking, you're looking at all these cameras, this range of cameras, you're looking at my darling little F4, you're looking at the F5 and you're thinking, isn't the design modern when compared to the F4? And the answer is, blimey yes. I mean, just compare it to the F5. I mean, really, really modern design. And just like the F4, the F5 was designed by a designer called Giorgetto Giuliero. I'm bound to have got that wrong, but the, the man was a genius. He designed dream cars like the Ferrari 250 GT, the Maserati 5000 GT, and the Fiat Panda. He even designed the DeLorean that you may remember was used in the film Back to the Future. Well, Back to the Past, 1999, and at $5,000, this beauty, this F film camera was used to turning heads and wallets. And it's easy to think that it copied the design of the digital D1, but no, no, no. You have to switch it around. The F5 was already three years old by the time the D1 pushed its way in. And I'm pretty sure it was easier to design and produce the new and unproven D1 if it followed the pattern of the established older cousin. I mean, don't forget that film was king at this time. Digital was viewed as a dodgy, unknown, unreliable upstart. I mean, it was a bit like the idea of professional wedding photographers using mirrorless today. Unthinkable. Well, it was six months ago. Now... I fully, fully intend to have a play and do a review of the F5. But today, I've run out of time. I've kept you long enough and I wish you good health. Happy Christmas. And if you're watching this in July, don't forget your sunblock. Thank you so much for joining me. And if you enjoyed this, please like it. And if you really liked it, please subscribe. I'm really just starting out with this stuff, with this video YouTube thing. And every comment, like and subscription means such a huge amount to me. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it and see you soon.